for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us No, you know that we can hold it down Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground And to all the listeners tuned in right now Got debates, analysis, and speculation This is sports talk for the new generation You know where to find us, got a reputation Sick podcast, your number one sports destination We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah Cause this is our time No, we no stopping us Till we reach the finish line Listen to the Sick Podcast. The Eye Test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy. The Stanley Cup winning Colorado Avalanche 
And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. And welcome to another edition of the Eye Test on the Sick Podcast Network. He's Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. And we are getting more and more excited. As you can see, I'm ready behind me here for the Springfield NCAA Regionals, where my alma mater, UMass, will be taking on Denver. And then Cornell will take on Maine. Pierre and I will be live from the Tap Sports Bar in MGM Casino here in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, tomorrow at noon, uh, there's a pregame party starting up at 11 a.m. So if you're in the area, you're going to the game, come on by, say hello, have some fun. We'll be talking tons of hockey. We will be having uh, the University of Massachusetts Athletic Director, Ryan Bamford, will be joining us live on air. And we will have plenty of hockey talk for the NCAA tournament, teeing you up for what is going to be a very exciting regional in Springfield, Mass, Pierre. There's no question. Jimmy, I know you're all excited about your Minutemen, and you should be. But, you know, how about Josh, the athletic director from Denver yesterday, how great he was. You know, fair and balanced what we're trying to do here. So I'm glad we're having Ryan on tomorrow, yep. uh, which is great. Balance it out, Minutemen, and, and obviously the Pioneers. Um, you know, I got the nicest text today uh, from Charlotte Graham. Uh, who we spoke about yesterday, oh, who's wow. the executive assistant of the Colorado yeah. Avalanche. She now works for Joe Sackick and the upper echelon of the management team in, in Colorado. But we were talking about Charlotte and Ron and John Graham yesterday as being legendary pioneer players. Uh, yes. And Ronnie was also an assistant coach with, uh, you know, with Ralph Backstrom. So, you know, lots of good stuff. But I, I, what a nice note I got from uh, Charlotte today. So I, if, if Charlotte's watching again today, thank you so much. Thank you for watching. That. Yep, we appreciate it. And yes, look, this is my only time where I'll uh, go all out UMass, Pierre. I had to do it today. Tomorrow I'm all business, neutral. You're all, don't worry. I'll hold you accountable. You are you don't pick winners in this. You know? You're there to inform and have fun. Exactly. And you've exactly. been very good at that. And what, what I am going to do, though, for our viewers and listeners, right when I get off, I haven't had a chance yet today, but right when I get off of this podcast, I am going to put together a little bracket if they want to join, and we can, we'll can we talk about who they pick as winners, not us, no, but who they pick as winners and who they like, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of go along with it as the tournament goes on, and we'll figure something out. We'll get some kind of nice prize whipped up for the winner, and uh We'll have some fun with it. But, yeah, we'll put that together later on. I've had some people actually reaching out to me, Pierre, saying you got to put together a bracket for the NCAAs because, you know, they do that in basketball. Yep. You don't see it much in hockey, though. But uh, I like it better in hockey, to be honest. Too many teams in it, in basketball. <laughs> uh, you know what? There are a lot of coaches that would be telling you on the college hockey side, I wish our tournament was bigger. <laughs> right. <laughs> or, yeah. You know, like late Lehman, late Lehman down in Providence, I bet you he wishes the tournament was bigger. You know, yep. I look at Colorado College. I bet you they wish the tournament was bigger. Uh, yep. I look at Guy Godowski at Penn State. I wish, I think he wishes the tournament was bigger. You know, there are a lot of teams that wish it was probably a little bigger. That being said, um, it's an exciting event. You know, I've been around it a long time. I coached in it mm -hmm. a couple times, and you know, it's it's a major event. It's a heck of an event. Do you think, Pierre, that they will ever uh, expand it? Has there been talk of that, or? I think if they expand the number of teams playing Division One hockey, so for instance, now Arizona State is a relevant team. I think you would agree, mm -hmm. and the Alaska schools have become very relevant. Brett Riley, who we had on this air, yes. LIU starting to become more and more relevant. And I think if you ever had, let's just say for the sake of argument, Indiana and the Big Ten all of a sudden becomes relevant in hockey, or Stanford or USCLA or USC become relevant in let's just say a conference out in the west with arizona state let's just say um i think then it would start to grow i do okay. but where we are right now i'd say no but if you started to get more significant schools involved in division one I, I think the answer would be yes and you know what i like pierre and look i i'm not i'll be blunt i'm not always the biggest fan of their network but uh espn has done a good job over the years of really getting this out there and covering more and more games. I remember when I was growing up, and you know this, Pierre, too, you know, you'd be lucky if you saw the Frozen Four, let alone just the national title game. You'd have to really look around and try and find, you know, put the tinfoil on your antenna or something on the TV trying to pick up a game. Um, but now you can just go on ESPN Plus and you can get every single game. So I think that's been great. And I, I also love the fact that 
it's giving a lot of up and coming uh, hockey announcers, uh, you know, play by play and color commentators a chance to uh, really hone their skills and, and take it to the next level. So that's great. I, like I've said before, I highly suggest people out there. It's worth the price, twelve ninety nine a month. They're not paying me anything to say that. I'm just telling you that because I know we got ton of, a ton of great hockey fans that love watching college hockey. It's worth it. You can see that, and you can also see a lot of NHL as well. So uh, check that out this weekend if you want to tune in and bounce around to the different games. Pierre, let's switch over, though, right now, and we'll we'll finish off with a little college talk at the end. Um, but let's switch over to the NHL because just a, a really busy night last night in the NHL. Lots of stuff going on. And, when, you know, let's start it off. We'll kind of – we'll do the pros – and the cons of what we saw last night. <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to be more diplomatic and say there were two leagues last night. There was <laughs> okay. the NHL heavy and there was the NHL light. Mm -hmm. I prefer the NHL heavy. Me so too. let's start out with Boston and Florida, okay? Let's That's do that. NHL let's do heavy. I know you watched it, so go for it. Well, I'm just going to say, look, credit, and we spoke about this, and I know you want to talk about it as well, credit to Jim Montgomery he got the troops going. He went at them in practice the other day with the bag skate and just reeling into them and then again to the media as well. And there were times in that game last night that they wound up winning 4-3 to three to Florida Panthers where you still saw some of that lackadaisical kind of in and out of the game emotionally type play. But you could tell he was keeping it up on the bench, what he was doing in practice the day before. Every time they went to the bench – he was really vocal there, and a credit to the leaders as well. From everything I heard and reading the postgame comments, you know, the likes of Brad Marsh and David Posnack, Charlie McAvoy, Charlie Coyle, guys like that really were getting the guys going on the bench, calming the situation down when they fell behind and helping them overcome that lead late to win four to three. That being said, Pierre, and, and again, I'm impressed. It was a gutsy win. I'm not taking that away. And, and how about Brad Marsh, and you don't want to see it, a 5'9 guy fighting a 6'5 guy when he takes on Mikola there. Um, but, you know, a lot of guts there. And he's trying to rally the team and, and get them going and, and, and really engage them. And I think it worked from that point on because before that, you know, I was texting with you and you, and you said right to me. I, I don't think you mind me telling them what you said about Sam Bennett. They said, somebody's got to address this right now because he was running around, just hitting anything in sight, getting under their skin. And then he he really had his way with Hampus Lindholm. He's not a fighter. Um, and, you know, you're like, oh, boy, this could be a long night for the Bruins. But, again, credit to Brad Marchand and the coaching staff. They got it together and won. The one thing that worries me, though, Pierre, is in a seven-game series, are the Bruins physical enough to handle the Panthers? We saw that they couldn't last year, and I just don't know if they're there again. You don't want – you know, your 5'9 captain taking on the big boys on the other side. I don't know how they answer that. I really don't. And it, the Panthers have a great way, and I know you're going to elaborate on this right now, of playing the game right on the edge without crossing over. And that's that's what worries me is that they can really just rattle the Bruins but stay out of the box. There are a couple things. I like your take, number one, Jimmy. Well done. So Hampus Lindholm gets absolutely mutilated by Sam Bennett, and Sam Bennett's toying with him. It's not fun to watch. I was shocked during the broadcast that not one person said, look at the reaction of Joe Sacco on the bench. Mm -hmm. Sacco's emotion came That's right awesome. through the TV screen at me, right through it. So mm -hmm. I haven't been down there <laughs> almost 2,000 times in my life. Right. Um, I'm going to tell you, you know that when you're sitting on that bench, you know that somebody's really ticked off. And I think that that moment there, Joe's uh, emotional outburst there, got everybody's attention because he's not an emotional – as you know, he's not an emotional guy, very normal, very civilized human. That got Marshan going. That got Pasternak going. That got McAvoy going. That got that team going. They didn't yeah. like that. Hoppus Lindholm is a popular guy. He's not a bad guy. He's a popular guy. Oh, yeah, he's the nicest guy. So that that got their attention. So that little subtle coaching maneuver by Joe made uh -huh. a big difference. Number that's number one. Number two, just before Pasternak scored off the awesome feed by Charlie McAvoy, watch how many hits Marsham delivers. Oh yeah, in that sequence. Okay. Check. Yes, watch how many hits he delivers. So that got everybody's attention. And then to me, the biggest thing is 
Trent Frederick scoring his goal. How It's his 18th of the year. How many times have we talked about the most improved player in the Boston Bruins is Trent Frederick? Yeah. 18 goals. That wasn't like a neophyte shot. That was a sh off the rush, Marshan to Frederick, boom, to the back of the net. So the number one thing I just want to say to our viewers and listeners, and this is not for the media, and they'll probably come after me. That's fine. You guys can go rip on Jim Montgomery all you want. None of you have ever coached the game in the NHL. You don't want to know what it's like to prepare your team to go into battle. Mm -hmm. I told Jimmy about this yesterday on the podcast. I said, yes. everybody's got to stop this. Okay? This isn't milk and cookies. This is real stuff. Yeah. The NHL is real stuff. This yeah. guy doesn't want to lose his job. Yeah. He doesn't want to – he wants this team to win. They cannot yep. afford to have a first-round knockout. I have mm -hmm. so much respect for Jimmy and what he did as a coach at the Boston Bruins the other day. That's what – to prepare your team to go into a big battle, mm -hmm. you have to prepare them mentally and physically. And he did that. So good yep. for Jimmy. Good for him. Pierre, one thing I want to ask you too, and I agree with 100% with everything you're saying, but going back to what you said about Sacco too. So Jimmy gives it to him the day before in practice, like we're just saying, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as, as you know, the assistants are, some, are, are usually the conduits between the yeah. players and the head. And, and a lot of times, the good cop versus the bad cop, right? And I think sometimes it must, you know, if, if a coach gets like that, who is usually maybe the good cop and all of a sudden he's just like, what is wrong with you guys? And, and he gets into that even cements at home even more. Right. So when, the, when the guy that's usually allies is not, a, not the word, but a guy that's usually on your side, so to speak, um, and is willing to listen to you and then convey that back to the coach, when he's coming at you too, you know you better get it together. And I, I think that's a great catch by you that you saw what he did there and how much of a factor it played for the Bruins. Well, I've, I've stood in his shoes. And, yep. um, you know, Scotty was not a very demonstrative coach. He was really loud on the bench. Mm -hmm. Badger was very loud on the bench as well. Scotty is extremely intense but never badgered players, no pun intended, on the bench. He would challenge them, but not like that. Um and sometimes you just have to calm things down. You would. Right. And other times you had to elevate it. You know, and there are times Absolutely. when we go into Philadelphia or we go into Chicago or even into Boston, in old Boston Garden, where, you know, the intensity level ratcheted up just a little bit. And so sometimes you just had to read the room as an assistant. And I, I have so much respect for Joe. You know, I watched him play at BU. He's a great player. I coached against him when he was in the NHL most of his time was really in Anaheim when I was coaching against him. I, I broadcast some of his games when he was a head coach in, in Colorado. I like mm -hmm. him a lot. I like Joe a lot. And so, you know, I, I really – I think sometimes you got to give the apropos shout-out to a person that did something that never got noticed. Yeah. And, and I, I noticed it, and I really respect that a lot, yeah. what he did. I really do. Pride of Medford, Mass. There we go. The town next to me where I grew up in Arlington. All right. Uh, let's uh hey, let's by the way, shout out to his brother David. Oh I yeah. Think the was whole a family really good player, but David was a brilliant player. Oh, David, David Sacco was a really, really good player. The, like I didn't got you know I went to St. Sebastian's, but I yeah. still followed Arlington High, which was a big hockey factor, yeah. as you know, back in the day under Ed Burns. Johnny Missouri, I know that boy. Yep, yep. And but, a good player. but but Pierre, the thing was, no matter how good Arlington was. If Medford was, you know, say 500 or just above 500, and they come in there with the Sacco brothers, they just did kill them. They just owned Arlington, you know, and it was it was all because of the Sackos. And I think the day those guys left and went on to college to BU, the town of Arlington was really celebrating. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I they agree. Were, they I were agree. On their side. All right, let's stay in the Eastern Conference. Another team I was talking to you about in the car earlier today, Pierre. Um, was the New York Rangers and they become the first team in the NHL this season to clinch a playoff spot. They're now at 48, 20 and four with a hundred points. Uh, first in the Metro first in the East first overall right now. But you know, I don't think they really care about the where, I mean, obviously they care. They want to get a good, a good slot in the playoffs, but it's more, and you know, there's Pierre being a coach and, and I hear it a lot with the Bruins and I'm sure you, every NHL team that's in playoff contention is preaching this right now is about the process. And when you look at the, the New York Rangers season, Pierre, it didn't for a while, it was not going as planned. And, and the biggest reason for that was, 
you know, Igor Shesterkin showed that he's human. Uh, and he came back down to earth from the amazing seasons he's had recently to just looking very human between the pipes. And thank the Lord that a UMass alum, Mr. Jonathan Quick, came along and was there for them while he was finding his, well, Shesterkin was finding his game and also while the team did. Well, now I look at that team and I, I you know, I, I saw it in person last week, but I look at them now. It, it, they've got it all going on right now. They're moving on all cylinders, Pierre. They're balanced. They're, there's no like one point where you say, well, that's their strength and this is their weakness. I just see them really in sync right now, and it's at the perfect time. And I give a lot of credit to Peter Lavalette, Pierre. Yeah, there's a good balance there. There's no question. I got to give Philadelphia a lot of credit in that game. They were part of the yeah. NHL heavy we were talking yeah. about last night. Yeah. They fought like heck. And, you know, if it's not for an Adam Fox overtime winning shot, which was a beautiful shot by Adam um, in a three on three situation, you know, who knows where that, that game is going. Philadelphia showed a lot of moxie, a lot of courage. Uh, but I agree with you on the Rangers. You know, one of the things that's going to be interesting. Can Mika Zibanejad elevate his game in a playoff matchup situation? That's going to be a big key for them. Will mm -hmm. Jacob Truba come back and help them physically? They need Jacob Truba back. I don't know what, when he's coming back and how healthy he's going to be. So that's a big part of this. And I think the third part is, you know, Alexi Lafreniere has had an unbelievable year. He, he's really had a tremendous year. I'm glad you said that. Not Can enough people talk. about Love yeah, yeah. remember at the beginning of the year when we first started the show, they yeah. were ruining this guy. They were killing him. Yep. The media, the media was killing. Oh, yeah, him. trade him. He's trade a bust. Him. He's a bust. They were. He was getting mutilated. Twenty-one yep. years old. Like, come on, give me a break. Yeah. Anyways, so he's had a great year. I, we have none of us have seen him do it in the playoffs. So mm -hmm. he's going to be a really important factor in playoff hockey. Yeah. But I, I would say that the, the team is actually going the right way. Peter and his staff deserve a lot of credit. Danny Muse, Phil Halsey, Peter, they deserve a lot of credit. They, and the, the one thing is they knew – this is where I think their season really turned, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. They knew after the Rempe stuff in Columbus, they miscalculated as a staff. They yeah. knew it. They, yep. they didn't talk about it publicly, but they knew. Because they really the next time they went to Toronto, mm -hmm. we saw what happened. It was a totally different scenario. And so I think they're watching the eye test. I'm not trying to toot our own horn, but, well, I mean, but it's, it's okay. But I really respect when coaches make adjustments. It's an important yes, part of this. Exactly. So I think that kind of helped them the last little while because the player saw, wow, the coaches really have our back. We're not just pieces of meat. And, and so I really respect that about Peter and his group. You know, Pierre, I, I'm glad you brought that up um, with Rampy there too, because I kind of sensed that as well from that Toronto game. And you and I have obviously had those conversations off the air um, but there was a, in that game last week against the Bruins, I don't know if you remember, um, I think it might've been Zibanejad. No, no, no. It was Panarin. So Panarin gave them the lead, I think in a second period. And that VC Goudreau Rempe line came out and instead of Rempe running around, just looking for something, looking for trouble. He was running around, but it was a calculated running around. Mm -hmm. It was a, I'm like, he was the definition of what you want on an energy line, if you know what I mean. And he's got a great yeah. guy that did a lot of it for Tampa Bay and Goodrill right next to him. And they, they cemented that game in my eyes with that shift right after that goal. They didn't score, but they sent a message. And then the Bruins were just like dumbfounded, like, what the heck? They had just given up a goal. And then they got this line coming out, just checking them on every play. And I stored that away in my head. I, I had meant to bring it up to you and I forgot. And now you just triggered it up. So I'm glad you brought that up because I thought that was a pivotal moment. And maybe it's pivotal in a bigger respect as well. The Islanders had a lot of success, obviously not as much this year. But when their energy line has been healthy with Matt Martin, they, oh. call it their, they call it their identity line with Casey yep. Zekas and Cal Clutterbuck and Matt Martin. That makes an impact. It does. Yep. And, and I think the Rangers – when Rempe's playing like that, when Goudreau's playing like that, and Jimmy Vesey's had a tremendous year. You know, he, he really – and I'm a big – look, at, again, being transparent, I like him a lot, like his father a lot, known the family. I coached against a father back in the mid-'80s when he played for Ronnie Anderson at Merrimack. He was a mm -hmm. great player. The father, Jimmy was Jimmy Sr., was a great player. Um, so I'm a big fan of the family. I'm just glad he's doing well there. But the truth is, is that that line could be really effective in a playoff series. 
You need those lines. It it could be really effective. I mean, Pierre, look at let's let's go back. Look at the color I'm wearing right now. Remember the more low line for the uh, Boston Bruins? Yeah, I absolutely. Do. And yeah. you were you know, Pierre, Holly, Gregory Campbell and Sean Thornton. I absolutely remember. And, and I've heard the story a million times, but I want that game seven story from you and how pivotal they were in that uh, way. They, just I'm tell just our viewers right that. now. They were unbelievable in Vancouver. I was doing the game and I kept talking to Eddie and Doc and saying these guys are running the game. And Gregory was great. Danny was outstanding. But Sean, nobody wanted to mess with Sean. After the Aaron Rome stuff, yep. if you remember, that got taken down a notch when oh, Thornton yeah. got out there. It just did. It really did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that Philly Rangers last night, big boy hockey. Boston, Florida, big boy hockey. Detroit, Washington, That's overtime, big boy hockey. And you asked me yesterday, who are the players that I thought were going to affect the outcome? I said, if Detroit wins, it'll be Dylan Larkin. Dylan didn't have a great game last night. If Washington wins, I said John Carlson. Two assists in the game for Carlson. He gets the overtime winning assist to Dylan Strom. It was a great play, really, really good play. Um, Carlson, I thought, was fantastic last night, stopping people defensively, creating offensively. And, you know, you said a really good thing the other day, Spencer Carberry. He's got to be in the discussion. Two got, We're going to get to Vegas and Nashville Two guys that need to be in the coach of the year discussion, Andrew Burnett in Nashville and Spencer Carberry in Washington. That yep. doesn't mean they're going to win it, but they need to be in the discussion, Jimmy. They have to be. Yeah. And, you know, Pierre, you, you bring up Carlson there, and you're so right. When he's when he's going, the team's going. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing the influence he has on that offense there in Washington because we, they, they've been missing him off and on for so many so long. Um, but when he's there and he starts to stay healthy and he's he's consistent right now, I think he's got something like a six game point streak going right now. Well, he's playing great. He's playing really well. He's playing really well. They're huge. But uh, yeah, I mean, look, Detroit. I'm with you. As Larkin goes, they go, and that's just the way it is. And we saw that when he was out for that extended period of time, they were just not the same team. Um, but there's good. They're going to need some of the other players, Pierre, and you know. Some guys like Kane, you know. Well, he scored a nice goal. Patty scored a nice yeah. goal last night. Debrinkin had a good goal and a nice assist. Like, there was some good stuff going on in the game for both of those guys. But I, I'd like to see more from JT Comfer. I think they need more from him. And, Jimmy, I know you're a fan of the player, as am I. But it's almost like Maurice Sider's not loud enough mm. at this point. Needs not to be louder. Thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. There yep. needs to be more – Thump, not hitting thump, but more thump from his game. Harder passes, cleaner breakouts, better entries, uh, more slickness on the power. But there needs to be more oomph. In purpose. His game. More yeah, purpose. purpose is good. Yeah. Purpose and and Pierre, I'm going to stay on that back end too because you've been hyping this guy up as well. You should. And he's now in that lineup. And that's Simon Evanson. Oh, man. He's good. <laughs> he is a big boy. Woo. So I saw him. Uh, two years ago playing in Sweden in Frölunda, which is in Stockholm. And it was, uh, uh, it wasn't Firestad. It was uh, Gothenburg in there. Um, And I would just tell you, he stood out so much against a really big lineup. Mm -hmm. He stood out so much. And I I came back, I was writing reports about him going, oh my gosh, I wonder if they'd ever trade this guy. You know, he'd be just (laughs) unbelievable with us. I was in Ottawa then. And, you know, I saw Dra- – I actually saw Chris Draper and Sean Horkoff over there, and I was talking to both of them, trying to grease the skids. So they were like, no, no, we're not moving him. <laughs> uh, a, a couple Guinness in them or what? <laughs> no, not in Sweden. No, it wouldn't be – not not Guinness in Sweden. Well, I guess you, guess you could in a couple Irish pubs. But no, in Sweden yeah. there's some other things you can imbibe, yeah. Okay, beautiful. Um, all right, let's get – because I see a lot of people in our comment. Uh, no, we start not done with NHL heavy yet. No, okay. Okay, so then Edmonton, Winnipeg. Okay, all right. Edmonton showed a lot. That's in Winnipeg against a Winnipeg team that lost three straight games going into that game. Edmonton showed a lot. Now, I wouldn't say that the goaltending was elite for either team. It was good, but it wasn't elite. But, man, oh, man, you can see the difference that Knobloch has made with that team and Paul Coffey, they've made a massive difference with that team. And um, I don't know if they'll be able to outscore their defensive problems, but they're much better defensively in, in Edmonton. Mm-hmm. 
than what they were. And I got to give a lot of credit to Winnipeg. They pushed back in that game. They were down to look like they were done. And in the third period, they pushed hard to get a tie and eventually get a point out of that. And good on Zach Hyman getting the overtime winner. Jimmy, like enough of the nonsense for Zach Hyman, please. Okay. No, no, don't talk any. I'm just saying. Okay. Enough of the nonsense. And I'm with you. That's okay, all we're going to say about stop, it. For everyone just stop out there. The nonsense. Stop yeah, it. And, and, you know, I know people that know him that watch us, Pierre. And, and just for everyone out there, I just want to say, and all this is all I'm going to say about it. We'll move on. He's a hard worker, very hard worker. And I'm he's he's one of the most decent individuals I've interviewed. And I've interviewed a lot, and you have too. I don't know him personally. I'm just going based on what I see yeah, yeah. and experience as a reporter. But I I do think, you know, after years of reporting and meeting a lot of people over the years, I, I th like to think I can judge people good. And I, I see he's aces. He's a good human being, and I'm very happy for him, for the success he's having this season. Yeah, Zach, don't let him get you down because there are a lot of people that think the world of you, and I'm telling you, he's a heck of a player. And yep. then the final one, NHL big boy, and this will be my last one. Then then you want to go anywhere you want, you go. Okay, buddy. Because I watch these games for a reason. Like, I oh, love yeah. the passion to watch them, and I really I do. Vegas, Nashville. So we talked about Vegas going into St. Louis the night before, if you remember. And they win in overtime, and good for them. They show a lot of moxie going in there and winning in overtime because St. Louis is urgent. Obviously, they need points. If they don't get them, they're not going to make it. And then they get the 3 nothing lead in Nashville. Nashville makes it 3-1. Then it's 4-1 Vegas. And then Nashville just explodes. And it's it's uh, Gus Nyquist. You know, you look at the play of uh, Philip Forsberg. You look at the play of Ryan O'Reilly. But, Jimmy, if he's not, I'm telling you right now, and, and Vegas eventually loses that game 5-4. Mm -hmm. If Roman Yossi is not one of the three finalists for the Sulky Trophy, then the people that are voting on that award should have their voting rights rescinded. I agree. I'm just, and that, you know why I say that? Because they're not watching the games. Nope. They're not watching the games. That man should be in the – I'm not saying you should win it because that's up to the voters. If he's not a nominee, there's a big problem with the voting process. I'm telling you that right now, Jimmy. And, and I'm going to take it a step further, Pierre, and you might think I'm not saying this, but he's their MVP. And I, I get that, you know, people don't like to give the MVP to a defenseman or a goalie because they have their own trophies. I always think that's nuts. I think if a guy's an MVP, that's it. That's all. I mean, I don't care what position he plays. I don't care if there's another trophy for him. If he's earned it, he should get it. I'm not saying that he should get the Hart Trophy, but I'm saying that he is playing Hart Trophy-worthy hockey right now for the National yeah. Predators because that's they are true. not on this run without him. He's been amazing both offensively and defensively. And one thing we, I said to you off the air, and I'll say to our viewers right now, another thing that bugs me about the Norris Trophy and will likely be the reason, unfortunately, that I think he doesn't end up getting it, is it's become the best offensive defenseman and not the best all-around defenseman. You can get 100 points as a defenseman and be over minus 20 and win the Norris Trophy. Yeah. And by the way, how's that, how's that, how's that player done this season? Yeah. We told you a long time ago, we don't make stuff personal. I'm not making it personal. I'm Good. just trying to say he he is what he is. He's an offensive defenseman, but he's not a defensive. Well, that's why I, I really think, and this will be the last soapbox moment I'll have. <laughs> soapbox Wednesday here on the eye test. <laughs> um, there we have be, that's there a good sponsor. The Bobby or, there should be the Bobby Orr Award, which mm -hmm. you go to the best offensive player on defense. Mm -hmm. And there, if you want to call it the Norris Trophy, or you want to call it the Langway Trophy, or the Robinson Trophy, or this—I don't I care what you want to call it. I'm yeah. acknowledging Bobby Orr because I think he's the best offensive defenseman that ever played. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ever. So he should get somebody should be the offensive defenseman. Yep. The defensive defenseman, the thankless job that does all the shot blocking and the matchups and gets no points or hardly any points, that could be the Norris Trophy. Look at Jimmy. We have the Rocket Richard. Right? We have the Rocket Richard Trophy, correct? That's yep. for the person that gets the most goals in the NHL. Well, that's for a forward. He's not going to win that. And then we have the Selkie Trophy, which is for the best defensive forward in the league. Right. So why but can't you do that? Have a defense. Yeah. Why is that that hard to comprehend? And don't I, tell me it's because they can't get sponsorship. 
Please yeah. stop the nonsense. We've gone from a $500 million business to a $5 billion business. Correct. And we have since I've been in the league. I'm just telling you. So from 1990 yeah. to 2024, it was $500 million when Commissioner Bettman came into the league. $500 million. Okay. Yep. It's five billion now. Don't tell me we can't get a sponsor for that. Please stop. Yeah. I don't I'm I don't know what what the reason is. I don't know if it's sponsorship here, or it's people are just being stubborn. Well, a long time ago I was told it was sponsorship, and I was like, Are you kidding me? Wow. Really? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm off the soapbox. Now let's talk. All right, I know, but I want I just want to bring just one more on this defenseman thing, and I'm not going after any single defense. And what I'm trying to say is I, I want that. I think it needs to happen. I just, how do we make it happen, Pierre? Well, you know, maybe we started today. Let's maybe we started today. Let's uh, <laughs> let's do it. Let's start a campaign. Maybe we started today. <laughs> well, I know, I know. Back in two thousand, from two thousand and two until two thousand and five, my former partner TSN and I, Gordon Miller, we had a campaign to get the red line out and allow the two line pass. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of old hockey. People that did not want that to happen. Of course. Look at the games now. Yeah. And watch the game from before 05, 06. And then watch the games after 05, 06. And you tell me what's better to watch. And watch the ratings. And watch the amount of fans that you drew in that were on the peripheral, didn't know if they wanted to be hockey fans, and you drew them in. Uh, you know what the other part is? Look at how many times teams can come from behind when they're down two, three, or even four goals. Oh, yeah. In the dead puck era, that didn't happen. No. No. Nope. not happen. You just shut it down. Yeah. All right. I want to just talk NHL about – What about NHL late? I thought you were going to do some NHL late stuff. But I think that's – I have one game I want to talk about, but I feel bad calling it NHL light, here because I just love the way they're playing right now, and that's the Montreal Canadiens. I'm going to go there again. That's not – though they played they played well. Sam Montembeau was great. What and a game. Let's just talk about that. They go into Colorado at altitude. They had a big win in Seattle the night – or two nights before. And to me, what impressed me the most, they had some divine intervention. I mean, Colorado hit tons of pipes in that game. They, they McKinnon was jumping through the gym again, and he looked great, and McCarr was good, and they, they were good. Colorado wasn't bad. No. It said Montembeau was really good. The pipes helped a lot, and the Canadians showed a lot of moxie. That's what I want to say, okay? That team, we keep saying this for all you Montreal fans out there that are still a little worried about the future. Look at the – don't look at stats right now. Look at the way they're playing. Look at the mentality they're developing out there. Like Pierre said, moxie. This team is competing every game as if their life depended on it. And it, it, nothing depends on it, really. For some, except for some of them, it might. It does, it does. But you know what I mean, Pierre. They're not, they're not, you know, it is what it is. I just love that they're they're out there and they're, they're, they're forming an identity at the right time. They're setting the table for next year. And they're going in. They don't seem intimidated by teams that are much better than them. And that was a perfect example of it last night. And that, that's well, what I love about them right now. Well, and I was so happy, by the way, to see Marty St. Louis back behind the bench. Marty, if you're watching, we're happy for you and your family. Congratulations yeah. for being back behind the bench. So, Jimmy, that's really well said. I don't have to say anything else. Really good. Thank you. Yep. That was much better than what I said. Really good. All right. Let's go to light. I, I you know. No, can you just, like, let's just make light fast. How's that? Okay, we're going to make it fast. You ready, Pierre? Yes. What the hell is wrong with you, Leafs? Okay, next time. That's <laughs> no, just, one, <laughs> just one thing on that. That would be to diminish what the New Jersey Devils did, especially Jack Hughes, okay, and especially one of your friends, Jake Allen, who I know yep. you like very much. Um, and Jake did some good things in that game. But after the first 20 minutes – do you mean to tell me that's the best Toronto can do? Like they bet I know they were missing players, especially Morgan Ryan. Not having Morgan Riley, not having Meyer. That I well, I get it. But that they gotta be harder not to play against. Don't they, Jimmy? They gotta be harder not to play they against. They have to be. They have to be, Pierre. And it's just you're trying, like I'm talking about forming an identity, right? And here we are, you're a team, you know you're going to the playoffs. We're almost into April in a couple days. What what is their identity? I well, don't I'm say it's an off. I'm going to say it's offense and puck possession. That's what I think their identity yeah. is. 
But does that, but that doesn't count, win in the playoffs. Does that count physical play? Does that count ground and pound? Does that count shot blocking? Does that count uh, defensive, you know, stalwart play? Does that count elite face-off play? No, none of that. Do you see resilience in that yeah, right no. now? So, so, so they're going to they're gonna have to really evaluate that going. I know that Sheldon Keefe wasn't happy at the end of the game. You tell me, by the way, you tell me one coach that could have been happy that would have been standing behind that bench no, last night. Not one at all. Why would you be happy with that? They yeah. weren't happy. I don't blame them at all. Yeah. I, I want to say one thing, Pierre. I want to relay back to where we started with the Bruins and Jim Montgomery and him calling out the, the his players, right, before that game yesterday. Keith goes, he calls out Tavares, a couple other guys. But they're – I don't know, Pierre. I just – I don't feel it from him as much as I felt it from Jim. Maybe that's because I was there in person. I'll, I'll, I'll put that I mean, as a You don't see Toronto practice, so to be fair, you don't see Yeah, that. so I, I don't know. I just feel like, though, is he hard enough on this team? I think so. Okay. I, do. I, I, I think so. And, you know, a guy that's standing next to him on the bench, um, well, there are two guys standing next to him that I like both. I think Guy Boucher is a good coach. I do. I always he's, like he's a really, really good tactician, I can tell you right now. If you don't believe me, go watch the 2009 World Junior Power Play that Canada ran. Ryan Ellis, John Tavares, PK Subban. You go watch that power play, and you—that's all. That was all created by Boucher. It was phenomenal. And Dean Chenault, to me, is one of the more unsung defensive coaches in the NHL. He's coaching the defense there. I know that when he left Carolina, they missed him, and it was all about money. Um, but he he does he's in your face. He's hard. The first time I ever watched Dino you know, coach was the 04 World Junior uh, in Helsinki, Finland. He was an assistant to Mario De Roche, and I thought he did a tremendous job with that team. That team should have won gold. They didn't. Long story. Um, but the next year, they most of those players came back and won in 05 in Grand Rapids. So I think the coaches actually are hard enough on them there. I do. I think okay. I just think there's a there's something missing with the roster construction. If that makes sense. It does. It does. It's just, it's gotta be, I feel for these fans. I really do. And I know our Montreal viewers don't want me saying that. No, no. It's Bruins fans, but you know what? for them, here's the biggest thing. You can't make it up. There are a few teams. The test is not going to be the last 10 games of the regular season. No. It's going to be the playoffs. Yeah. So if Toronto goes in and gets absolutely, destroyed in the playoffs in the first round, there's going to be a problem. Yeah, you're going to have to blow things up. There's going to be a problem. And if Boston gets beat up in the first round and doesn't win, there's going to be a problem. I agree. I agree. One I thing mean, I'll say. I'll, I don't know what ahead. the problem's going to be, but there's going to be a problem. Yeah. One thing I'll say, though, about Boston, too, and, and I wonder if it will actually work to their advantage, Pierre, is they've got like nine UFAs. There, a lot of roster turnover could happen in the summer, not just because of performance on the ice. No, no. Because it is what it is. Well, and they've it got is. a ton of cap space, and they probably already have some guys targeted they're going to go after. So I wonder if that, in in effect, fuels them even more, fuels the players. It, it, I, I like it here in Boston, and I'm going to have to show that right now and in the playoffs that I want to stay. I want to be one of the guys they bring back. You know, yeah, and, uh, I mean, we don't know, but okay, keep going. We got a couple more, then we got tons of questions. I know we got. I'm good. I'm good, Pierre. If you want to do any more games, right, other than do a couple more NHL lights because I it was a it was a big night last night. Not everybody could watch all the games, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, well, I mean, Pierre, the one thing I want to say right now, when it comes to light, okay, and this is interesting. I look, it was weird. I'm looking at the games last night going in, trying to break them down, who I like, what, what's, you know, what might happen here. I had this weird feeling about the Penguins beating the Hurricanes. Now, I don't, I'm not going to go off on a tangent because the Hurricanes have been rolling since the deadline. But ironically, a team that's struggling mightily right now, I thought exposed some things with the Carolina Hurricanes last night that they maybe need to look at. And I, I thought maybe, in the back end there, they just weren't strong enough. I, I didn't see them digging in the corners enough. They, they need to shore that up a bit there, and obviously the goaltending could be better as well. They didn't finish their chances for sure. Uh, Nadelkovich, who's a former teammate of the guys in Carolina, 
He played really well last night. He did. Hats off to him. There was one great sequence where he made an awesome save, and Sebastian Ajo must have been buddies with him. I don't know that, but Sebastian Ajo stood over for about three or four extra seconds. You could see they were talking to one another, and I'm sure Ajo was saying, great save, you know, Alex, good job, because that's just the kind of guy Sebastian Ajo is. But you look at Gensel. Gensel had a ton of shots. I think he had six or eight shots on goal last night coming back to Pittsburgh for the first time. I wouldn't overreact to Carolina's game. I thought Pittsburgh good for them, and I was really happy for Mike Sullivan getting a win at home, when they, especially after that game in Colorado when they had mm-hmm. the lead and they lost yeah. it. Um, but there was a couple other games that just they weren't good. I mean, Anaheim's got to be better, Jimmy. And, you know, Coach Cronin's our friend, and we like him a lot. I don't think this is on him. I don't. I don't think it's on him, and I don't think it's on Pat. I just think some of the players are not mature enough right now. Yeah, they're in their lineup, and that's just because they're kids. They're kids. Right. But on that, go that's on that cool. note, Pierre. You know, that's something you want to really focus on with these kids right now. Is do they dig deep and find it when it doesn't matter? The season. No, I over. think this is so. This is where you have a captive audience. So you know Greg Cronin, and I know Greg Cronin. Mm-hmm. So today, I guarantee it wasn't camp fun. It was no. camp no fun. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And so they're going to learn. This is how yep. you teach them. Um, and then, you know, I know people in San Jose get a little well, up. I was just going to go there. Stuff, <laughs> that can't, like, can't start a game like that. Yeah. It, the word I said to you. I'm so tired of people going after the coach there, too, by the way. Prep it. Hey, the Put word Scotty I said. Prep it. On, and he's my friend. Put Scotty Bowman on that bench. See if he would do any better. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm just telling you, David Quinn's a really good coach. This is on the players. They this, need the, to be, their be, players aren't good enough. Yeah. They're not good enough, Pierre, but they could also, you know, have a little better attitude, I think, uh, you know, out there. I mean, I just, I don't know. Like, the, we've said it numerous times, and I think, you know, I know we took a beating from Sharks fans, and they're upset what we said. We're just telling it like we see it. We don't mean it as an insult. But I think, as we said before, you know, Anaheim, we just talked about it right now, what Greg Cronin's probably trying to do right now. What's he trying to do? And what have the Montreal Canadiens been trying Implement to do? Implement standards. Standards, culture, and, and, and attitude, and, and just an understanding of who are we going to be? Where do we want to go? What? Where are we going right now? Do we have a, yes. do we have a target? And yes. I don't – I'm not there, okay? So I'm not going to pretend to know what's going on. I'm not there enough to say it. But from afar – the word I hate to use it. It's a little strong here, but it seems like rudderless. That's that's the feeling I get with the Sharks right now, and I don't know if that's too strong, but that's the feeling I get. I might be strong because I think they do have a plan. I just think it's going to take a long time to implement the plan. The hurdle trade. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to create cap space and everything else, but you know that's a tough message. You know, you look at all the good players that have left there now, and if you're Logan Couture, I know you want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, but realistically, you know, how many years do you have left? You know, well, on the flip side of that though, Pierre, I mean, are they just stripping it down? And is well, that- so if they are, so let's just say that their plan is to get Mac. Let's just say their plan is to get Mac when celebrating. They can't, there's no way they know that because right. there's a lottery, right? They, they, there's no guarantee. Like I was in the room, Jimmy, and there weren't a lot of us when Pittsburgh won the lottery in 2005. Trust me when I tell you, there might have been 25 or 30 people in that room. I was for the media side. I know I was there with James Duffy, Bob McKenzie, Gordon Miller, and myself from Canada. I mm-hmm. I can tell you. And then I think there were a few from the French side. I think there were a few from Anaheim. There weren't a lot of people, Jim. I'm just telling you. And when Pittsburgh won over Anaheim and over Carolina, one franchise got went like this. Yep. And the other ones kind of stayed. I know Anaheim eventually won the cup in 07. Crosby would have affected that, but they still won. Yeah. But, you know, save yeah. Pittsburgh. It saved yeah. Pittsburgh. It did. It really it did. Not, it saved their team, saved their franchise. Yeah. And Mario Lemieux. <laughs> don't forget everything he did for them. God bless him. Oh, um, don't worry. He watches. Hi. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's, let's open it up to the questions, Pierre. Right, because no, we got a lot. Let's go. Let's do it. What do we? Oh, and before we do, sorry guys, want to mention our uh, our factor boys there. I actually.
brought a few on the road. Again, I love the uh, the Factor meals. Uh, if we can pull it up there. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easy. Head to factormeals.com slash itest50 and use the code itest50 to get 50% off. Again, that's factormeals.com slash itest50 and use the code itest50 to get 50% off. I'm telling you, they got not just healthy meals. They have healthy apps, healthy like munchy food. Okay, so you don't have to get that greasy stuff. I'm telling you guys, it, it tastes great and you feel great afterwards. And that's the most important thing as well. And then let's go over to our friends at Manscaped, shall we? Uh, we love ha having them be part of the eye test. And I want all of you men out there right now to remember this season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Go to manscaped.com and use code eye test for 20% off. And free shipping. Again, that's manscaped.com. I test for 20% off and free shipping. All right. Let's hit these questions. As man, they're lining up. What do we got? Filterless bear. Good name. One word to describe Leaf's situation. Greed. Can't complain about lack of depth when you want to be paid more than McDavid. Uh, filterless bear, with all due respect, I completely disagree. If they're offering the money, then you take it. I, I, I don't like, I mean, if these players are good enough to get that money and it's being offered to them, I don't blame them. I blame the team and, you know, people get mad at players a lot. We've seen it a couple of times. I started in Boston this year pair with Linus Almark instituting his no, who's uh, no trade clause. Hey, the team gave that to him. It's not his fault. He's, he earned that. He got it. It's his right to use it. So I get it, guys. I know you, for Leafs fans out there, you want that to be more balanced against the cap and you want to be able to spread the wealth a bit, but that's on management, not the management they have now, the previous management, but that that is not the player's fault, in my opinion. A ditto. All right. Let's, next question. What do you guys think is going on with Caulfield? In my opinion, this is his first full season in the NHL and it's starting to show nowhere near as dangerous as he was last year. Pierre, I'll let you take this one. I thought last night, if you look at some of his sequences, he was really good. He didn't finish plays off, but I thought he was solid. Uh, playing with Suzuki and Tsevkoski helps him a lot. Um, is he going to be – usually, not always. Usually players are second year, take a bit of a step back. I'm talking about full seasons, not half or ten game segments. So he's taking a little bit of a step back. I think part of that is because – the power play hasn't been as good as they wanted it to be in Montreal. I think that's eventually where he's going to get a lot of his points. And also, they're basically a one-line team after Kirby Doc went down. And because of that, everybody's putting all their attention on that line to stop them. And it's a hard game to play, especially when you're undersized. I would be more patient with him. And I do think eventually he will be a very, very elite scorer for Montreal. Yeah, and I, I just further on that, Pierre, too, I actually – have seen some things I like defensively from him that I didn't see before. I see him trying to, he's not great defensive, but I, I, I feel like he's really trying to learn different aspects of the game and become more of a well-rounded player. So I, I, yeah. I like that. And I'm with you, Pierre. Can you, you keep saying it and I don't know why anybody can't accept it. If you have a healthy Kirby talk in that lineup, they're a whole different team and they're going to be a lot more fun to watch. And I think they're already fun to watch. So New, New Hook was a good acquisition. New oh, he's makes great. A difference. He makes – see the energy last night? I know he's going back to Colorado. But you see the energy after they scored and he's on the yep. – like, that was awesome. That was really good. So, no, I, I think the Canes really are trending the right way. They really are. All right, next question. Alex Evanoski, you think Buffalo and New Jersey has a chance to get in? I would like to see one of them get in. So much young talent. The math is hard for them, but they got the youth on their side. I say no. I don't know about you, Pierre. I say no. Yeah, and I, I'm with I'm with the I'm with we the, like we like both staffs. Oh yeah, Alex, I want them in. I'm we, with you too. I, mean, I want to see them blood in the play. I want to see them play too. The play. Yeah, especially Jersey after what they did last wow. year with the Rangers. But I, I just the math is too tough. I just don't see it being able to happen. Yeah, but I think one thing I will say, and sticking with Jersey there, Pierre, this year couldn't wind up being a blessing in disguise. I think it taught a lot of those younger players. It doesn't come easy. You can't just base everything on last year and expect that what happened last year will happen again. I think they learned a hard but very valuable lesson, and they will apply it. So I would take it one step further. Um, I think Tommy tried to get Markstrom, 
and he mm -hmm. wasn't able to get him. And I think he was late to the draw. He should have addressed the goaltender a little earlier. And I think if he would have done that, it would have given them more of a chance with 10 games to go or 11 games to go than what they're looking at right now. I mean, they're, they have to hope that somebody completely craps out for them not to make. I mean, they can do great things, but somebody's going to have to completely fall apart for them to get in. I'm with you. And they are playing better hockey as of late. They are. 100% they are. They are. They are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure they are. All right. Next question. Morantz, gentlemen, which team on top of the standing is likely to lose in the first round, in your opinion? Ooh, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but no, because what you need to do is not just these, you got to look at the West. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, Vancouver has to play Vegas in the first round. That's not an easy matchup, Jimmy, for Vancouver. That, that's a beast of a matchup. I mean, think about it, Jimmy. If they had to, So I don't know which team it will be, but somebody in the West, somebody is going to get stuck with a brutal matchup because you you get Vegas or you get Nashville. I don't think that's an easy out for anybody, Jimmy. I just don't think it is. You know, I just don't think it is. Uh, I'm 100% with you. The one thing I will say, Pierre, right now is I, I – you said – so I don't think Va uh, Vancouver matches up with Vegas that good, but I think Dallas matches up with them okay. And right now, as we speak – Well, they do. So I agree with that. Well, last year they matched up well with them, but they still lost. Yeah. Vegas beat them in the yep. playoffs last year. And I and, and they, I don't think anyone wants they, anything to do with Nashville. Think about last night. Vegas loses. They don't have Petrangelo and they don't have Carrier in the lineup. Yeah, let's not forget that. And they don't have and they don't have Hurdle in the lineup. Yep. Okay. So you put those three players in the lineup. Yeah. Vegas. Yeah. That makes a big difference, man. Those are yeah. three big time players, like for their roles. Carrier's role as a fourth line player is elite. He's an elite yeah. energy yeah. player. You yep. know, Hurdle is a top six forward on any team in the National Hockey League. Mm -hmm. And Petrangelo is a top two defenseman on any team in the National Hockey League. Yep. So you had those guys? Like, I don't yep. know. Vegas is a tough out to me. I think this is actually a great talk with two, Pierre. And I, I know we don't like talking about betting, but I just would say, if you're a betting person and you tend to take or you just kind of look at the stats, you look at the standings and you tend to take favorites, be very careful in this playoffs. Yeah, because I think what what this this is a great question. I think we're gonna see a lot more upsets than we're used to, and that's just how good the parity is in the NHL right yeah, now. And if we go, to the Conference, if we go to the Eastern Conference, Pierre, I think tonight could say a lot about the Bruins in the first round because as of now, they're playing the team. They'll play in the first round. That's the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah, no, I mean Ottawa they're Buffalo is not going to affect anything. <laughs> Ottawa. What's that? Buffalo. Ottawa Buffalo is not going to have an impact, but Boston Tampa will have an impact. Yes, I yeah, agree. I agree. No, I think it's going to be interesting in both conferences. Um, it's going to be exciting, and that's the thing. The West still appear like you were just talking about all the good teams and how many teams could be gone, and the, that's that's why I kind of and we we could go on. A, we won't go on a soapbox now, but it's a topic for another day, maybe before the playoffs start. Give me the old setup, please. Because I hate seeing some of these great teams gone in the first round. I know, it, you know, it is it is what it is. But, man, I just love to see some of these teams be able to go deeper and not have to X each other out. But we shall see. Next question. Next question. What grade would you give the Habs rebuild blueprint to date? And do you believe they can challenge for a playoff spot next year or the year after? I give it a... A minus, and I think they challenge for one next year. Don't know if they make it, but they definitely make it the year after. I give them a B plus, solid B plus. I'm a hard marker, and I do think they have a chance to make it next year. And if they don't make it next year, they will make it for the next five years after that. Mm, there we go. There we go. All right. Next question. Morantz, gentlemen, on the topic of top offensive defensemen, would you agree that the three top F Offensive defensemen in order of priority are as follows or coffee and Robinson. 
Yeah. I would have corn coffee in there. I don't know if I put Robinson in. Would you? I, I definitely would have Larry in there. Okay. Um, because if you don't, he's going to come punch in the mouth anyways. Um, <laughs> he's such a good person. No, Larry, I'm only – he's such a good man. He's an amazing person. Um, I was thinking about Denny Podve. Okay. Just, I, I, just I was, and then, with all due respect, Brian Leach was pretty good. I was going to go there. Sergey Zuboff was pretty good. You Raymond. know, there's some guys that there were some guys who were really good offensive. Larry Murphy was pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I had the chance yeah. to coach him. So there, are, Nick Litchman wasn't half bad on defense when it came to manufacturing offense. No. Nope. So that's a hard one. After that's a very hard question. After Orin Coffee, it's hard. Those you know two are that, separated. That's a great conversation banter. The next time we're in Hurley's, that's what that is. <laughs> over, over one too many Guinness. And I, don't forget a current uh, or two current defensemen that are playing right now up here, Adam Fox, and then, of course, a man that went to this school behind me. Kim McCaw. Kim McCaw. I look, Jim He's Montgomery. From Massachusetts, Jimmy. Call him McCarr. He's from Alberta. McCarr. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to just say something quickly, too. Jim Montgomery took a lot of heat last year when the Colorado Avalanche were in town. It was in November of uh, 2022. And he said he will go down to be just as, if not better than Bobby Orr. Yeah, that was. I know. You never. But all I'm saying is if somebody like, and I, you know, this is a guy that works in high, he's a coach and I, tr I trust his opinion. Just to say that, just that the guy is getting mentioned in the same breath already is pretty amazing. Pierre. What's Jimmy's birth year? I'm huh? not sure. He's, uh, what's Jimmy Montgomery's birth year? Jimmy's about like five years older than me, maybe. So he's like 56, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure he had a chance to watch Vintage Oil. <laughs> All right, next question. Which Habs D-man prospect is closer to being NHL ready? Oh, we, we saw that we talked about this yeah. yesterday. Right? Yeah, okay. Mayu is. Mayu is the most NHL ready. Hudson's the most ready to run a power play. And Reinbacher is a real good project, and he's going to play in the league for a long time. There we go. And that question was from Vid Zombie, by the way. All right, next question. Filter the spare again. Pierre's thought on yeah. Florian Jack guy. I think he'll be a stud in the OHL playoffs and will fight for a spot with the Habs in September and October. I don't I don't know if you can have two of those guys in your team. That's the only problem. And with Struble there, uh, with, the, uh, you know, Arbor obviously being there, I just don't know. So I think he's going to be getting some time down in the American Hockey League, but I do think he will have a big run in the OHL. 100% agree. that. Who wrote that? That was a really good uh, question. Yeah, put that up again, guys. So give him credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good one, actually. I think Jack Guy's brother's going to be good. Is it Filterless Bear? Filterless Bear was, filterless yeah. Bear, that's what. So I, I agree with what he said. Good questions today. He's, just, he's, just, he's not going to be ready for next year. He will yeah, not be. I'm with you on that. All right, next question. Rangers – oh, we're going to have to do rapid fire, by the way. Yeah, let's do rapid fire. Let's go. Jason Logan says, Rangers are on another, another level to every other team. Completely agree. Um. They are. They're, they're at the top echelon, but I would just tell you right now, Colorado's really good, too. <laughs> just tell you. That's my Stanley Cup pick, Colorado Rangers. That's All right, good. next question. Mitch Balin, do you think Allen will play the games to make that second that pick a second rounder? Good question. I don't know. That's a really good question. Though. I That's don't a great know the question. answer to that. Depends there's when they're eliminated, right? Depends on how long Jersey's alive. Yeah. All right. Great next question. question. Great question. Robert Letourneau? Letourneau, Letourneau. Hi, Jimmy and Pierre. Enjoy your show. Do you think you guys see the Habs trading three to four defensemen to make room for the backlog of defensemen they have? Would be great to add some offensive help. But I don't know about that use, many, but they'll be trading some. They're going to have to use one of those D uh, as a chip in the game to get scoring, and they know that, but that's one of the reasons why you that's what, draft and develop defensemen because they're major chips in the game, 100%. Exactly. exactly. Go Robert, Robert. Oh, All right, next question. Jason Logan again. Afternoon, Murphy and Pierre. Same to you, Jay. Maybe you guys have talked about it, but the Leafs always do well in the season. What do you think they need to go deep in the playoffs? Well, yeah, we've addressed it ad nauseum here, Jay. I, I think they they need more, as Pierre likes to say. Paper. 60 grit sandpaper. That's right. That's right. They could be using that guy Lafferty that's in Vancouver right now. I'll tell you that. All right, next question. 
Morantz, gentlemen, observation. Mm-hmm. Laval Rockets are making a push and are now in the playoffs, and I'll agree it is thanks to the goalie, Jacob Dobis. How do you say it, Prayer? Dobis. Dobis, okay. Why isn't anyone talking about him? I'll tell you why nobody's talking about him. He's in the American Hockey League, and he's doing exactly what he's supposed to do, and he's done a really good job, so hats off to Jacob. But part of why they're not talking about him is the Canes are overloaded with prospects, and one of them is Jacob Fowler. Yeah, and if it comes down to Jacob Dobis versus Jacob Fowler, Jacob Fowler's going to win. No, yeah. maybe Dobis finds a, a place somewhere else. We'll see. All yeah. right, next question. Stephen Falk finally caught one of the sick podcasts live. Nice. Which forwards would the target? Thank you, by the way, Stefan. Uh, which target would be for Montreal in the upcoming draft? Do you think would they go for Iserman with their top pick? That's what I've been saying. I've been saying that, that in early. Up. And, yep. and part, of, part of why I say that is he's committed to Boston University. Jay Pandolfo is an elite coach. He knows how to develop players. And, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Jack Gordon, um, Jeff Gordon's son plays at Boston University. And also Kent Hughes' son plays at Boston University. So there's built-in intel there, too. And I, I do think that Boston University does a great job cultivating young players. So I, I just think that that's where they'll go. All Eisenman does is score. He's a, he's a scoring machine. He's just a scorer. That's what he does. All right. Next question. Enter tap. Winnipeg Jets. Contenders or pretenders? Boy, I oh contenders. Boy. You know, it's a great question again. So I, all I'll say is I wouldn't disrespect them by saying pretenders. I'll just say the West is loaded, and I don't know if Yeah, it goes to what I was just saying, right? Unfortunately, yeah. there's going to be some really good teams it's, that don't make it out. Just, I don't know if they have enough in the West. I just don't know. I just yep. don't know. All right. Next question. Despite Jordan Harris having a three-year contract, what are the chances he's traded between now and next year with the logjam of bigger offensive PP and PK defensemen making the team out of camp? I Look, I've heard his name, but I, I don't know. Who knows? But all we are going to stick, we'll stay with the narrative that, yeah, we do see a defenseman getting dealt. Oh, I think I don't know if it's Jordan, but I see a defenseman being moved. It's a huge chip in the game. They need offense. Yep. You know, they need yeah. offense. And yeah, they I love had, you here. This they is had, so let's just say they had 35 goals. A guy that gets a 30 to 35 goal score. That changes where you are in the standings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll talk to you off air. I have an idea about that. And we'll talk, we'll talk about it. No, no, you're going to, you're going to, you will laugh when I say it. All right. All right. Next question. Randy Workman, Jimmy, are these college player signings, are they compatible like getting another second round pick? No. No, no. Some of them are. Some Some of them aren't. Yeah. Um, You know, some of them are depth players. You know, I know a lot of guys are being offered contracts that are American League deals that aren't NHL deals. I know some that are being offered NHL deals, but really to get the kid to leave school, they're they're given the NHL side of it just because they think they can cultivate something out of them. But no, I wouldn't. That's too high. I wouldn't say that. Not one size fits all. Some of them. Yes. Yep. But not all of them, no. I wouldn't say that. Sure. All right. Well, that's it. That's that's the questions for today, Pierre. We – You did a good job, Jimmy. Yeah, Sammy did a great job, my I was friend. looking at the time. It's 5.08. I didn't – We, go, right? we steamed through there. I like that rocket fire. There we so, go. All right. Well, Tomorrow you and I are going to be there for 11, but we're yep. on the other 12. And that's right. a tap at the MGM in Springfield, Massachusetts. Correct. And so I would suggest, too – if you are coming out there and you, you kind of want to meet Pierre and I or talk with us and stuff, probably get there before noon because Pierre, right after we're off the air at one, we're going to bolt over and get the game. One of the ring. Hey, can I say one thing? Thank you to Factor. Thank you to Manscaped. They, they've been amazing. They've been with us almost right from the start. They've done amazing stuff for us, and we're grateful. Thanks to the folks at Hurley's, by the way. Uh, for everything they did for us two weeks ago. We're not done going to Hurley's, by the way, as you know. know. And uh, we got more to come. We have some more surprises to come. We do. neat. We do. Do, And I want to remind everyone, too, for the UMass fans out there, UMass Athletic Director Ryan Bamford will be with us live in person at the tap in the MGM Casino in Springfield tomorrow. So really looking forward to that. Uh, Pierre, any final thoughts before we go, my friend? I had so much fun with you. I, every day is fun. I look, I so look forward from four to five. You know, I got a bunch of different radio shows that I do in oh, different yeah. places. And, you know, I try to talk to my hockey friends over the course of the day. And I just having this exchange is so, I don't know. I think it's just so therapeutic for me. That's the word I was just going to use. <laughs> I have so much, like, 
I'm fortunate because I get a lot of intel and I want to share it with people. Yeah. You know, there's some stuff I can't share, obviously, because it's confidential, but most of it's not confidential. And I really want to, I, I want to see the game grow. I know right. you do too. And that's a big part of what the eye test is about. Yeah. I really want to see the game grow on the women's side and the men's side. And I want to say to uh, to our guest we had yesterday, Josh Berlu, who I found out was a former was neighbor awesome. of mine in college yeah. uh, for only a semester. But but anyhow, he, you know, he he reached out and said, you guys do a great job. And he said, thanks for promoting college hockey. And yeah. I just I know I speak for Pierre. It's our honor to it because is. we love the game of college hockey. Uh, we love the growth that it has made in the last few years and continues to make. So. It's our honor to, to keep that as part of the conversation here. Uh, and we're really looking forward to the regionals in Springfield starting tomorrow on the eye test at noon. Remember, not 4 o'clock. We will be live at noon. Of course, you can hear it later on all the podcast platforms. But live at noon from the TAP Sports Bar in the MGM Casino in Springfield, Mass., before the UMass Denver game. We hope to see you there or else we'll see you here in the comments section He's Pierre McGuire. I'm Jimmy Murphy. This has been another edition of the Eye Test on a Sick Podcast Network. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Eye Test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.